Have Ways of Making You Talk presents The Cauldron by Zeno, read by Al Murray. Chapter 11. Bridgman stood on the top of a tower at the western edge of the allotments, which were to be the new supply dropping zone. Corporal Armstrong and Fraser crouched over the Eureka behind the protection of the three-foot-high brick and stone balustrade. O'Neill knelt at the top of the spiral staircase. From where he stood, Alan could see the remainder of Gorman's section in position round the tower. Murray and headquarters section lined a wood to the northwest of the allotments and Blake straddled the road with a force made up of the remnants of his own section and Marsden's. Farther away, on the other side of the allotments, he could see the men from the RESC recovery company waiting in readiness to carry out their task of retrieving the supplies and assembling them at the divisional dump. He was worried about what might lie farther back in the wood beyond the point where Murray's men lay in the shallow, grave-like slits they had scratched for themselves with their short entrenching tools. He checked the Eureka and, followed by O'Neill, went down the spiral staircase and along the western fringe of the allotments to the edge of the wood. Fraser peered over the balustrade at the officers retreating back. Armstrong called to him sharply, Get back here, you bloody idiot. Your head's stuck up there like a target in a shooting gallery. Fraser grunted and, squatting down, lit a cigarette. As an afterthought, he offered one to the corporal and gave him a light from his own. He sat back against the outside wall of the tower and watched Armstrong as he raised the earpiece to his head. Armstrong's eyes were as red-rimmed as an albino's, his grubby cheeks were sunken and the points of his shoulders were inclined inward by their extra fraction to which an observant eye denotes imminent physical exhaustion. Fraser wondered whether his own appearance was at all like that of the corporal. Armstrong looked up at Fraser. I can't hear a thing, he said. If they're going to be on time, they should be triggering by now. Fraser shrugged and looked at the sky to the south. I don't think it matters very much, he said. The whole show's cocked up anyhow. Everything depended on speed and surprise, and both have gone by the board. If Second Army does get here and manages to bridge within our perimeter, they'll be in no better position, really. They'll be sealed off on this side of the river instead of on the other, that's all. There'll be no lightning-armoured thrust across the great German plain. Armstrong lowered the earpiece and looked at his companion. He didn't understand Fraser any more than he did the other men in the company who were of the same social background and upbringing. He knew Fraser had been at Cambridge and had come down after his first year to join up. He had had the opportunity of going to an OCTU, but had refused, preferring to remain with the independent company as a private soldier. Roy Fraser, Tony Hardy and the other public school and university men had all refused stripes at some stage of their soldiering, and yet, any one of them could have become an officer if he had chosen to. They had an air of cynicism that was deceptive. At least, it had deceived Armstrong for a long time. He had discovered that beneath their cynical attitude and pretense that nothing was really worthwhile, they were good soldiers and were to be relied upon in an emergency. He wondered why they considered the contrived artifice of their manner to be necessary. Armstrong raised the earpiece again, but still hearing nothing, he lowered it and looked back at Fraser. Fraser was reclining easily, managing somehow to look as relaxed as if he were on a lawn at his home, lightly dressed in flannels and an open neck shirt, instead of the levelling uniform and smock. Corporal Armstrong was proud of being in the parachute regiment, and even prouder of being in Major Jordan's company, and his greengrocer father was proud of him, and for him, and so was his mother. He couldn't understand the attitude of these men, who deprecated everything they or their unit did. He knew his own attitude was the more honest one, but he was not sure whether or not it made him a better man. He had been in action with Fraser, Hardy and the others many times, and he knew he would have to be very good indeed to be better than they were. Fraser was one of those who had thrown his steel helmet away on landing and had replaced it with his red beret covered by a camouflaged veil. Now, as he took this off and ruffled his fair hair, his good-looking face untroubled and disdainful, Armstrong was filled suddenly with a love-hate emotion which disturbed him and sent him frowning and muttering back to the Eureka. If only the triggering would start, he would get the exhilarating and omnipotent feeling he always experienced when bringing in aircraft or gliders. Perhaps the others felt the same way, felt the same power that he did when, with the aid of the small compact box, he summoned the great planes and gliders out of the sky and onto their objective. I shouldn't worry too much about that little box of tricks if I were you. Fraser's voice carried the trace of half contemptuous amusement which angered Armstrong more than anything else. If I'm not very much mistaken, here they come now. Armstrong pulled away from the obscuring brickwork of the tower's centrepiece and looked back over his shoulder. At first, he failed to pick out the aircraft, and then he saw them as faint specks in the clear sky far to the south. 
He looked at his watch. The time was right. It was unlikely that they were enemy fighters. He knelt, his heart pounding with apprehension. What had gone wrong? He checked and rechecked the erection and frequency settings of the Eureka and found no fault, but he had no way of being absolutely certain that his set was transmitting. The highly secret instruments were serviced and charged by the RAF. The job of the independent company was only to land and operate them. Armstrong stood up and looked over the parapet towards the wood. He was looking for Bridgman, although he knew it was too late for anything to be done. The aircraft would be overhead long before another set could be brought into operation. He failed to see his platoon commander and turned to join Fraser, now also on his feet, and together they watched the first planes cross the Rhine, growing bigger every second as they flew at between five and six hundred feet, straight through the flak which was beginning to burst about them. And now the first planes were overhead, and Bridgman and O'Neill were pounding up the last stone steps of the staircase to join the watching pair. They didn't trigger. Armstrong joked the words out defensively, as if it might be his fault that the aircraft were continuing on to the north, beyond the area still held by the division. Bridgman glanced quickly at the set. So far as he was able to judge, it was in order and the frequency the right one. He swore aloud. On the allotments, Gorman had lit smoke canisters and other members of his section were waving the yellow recognition signals. Some of the men were on their feet, waving their weapons and steel helmets in an effort to attract the attention of the pilots. On the tower, the four men watched with sinking hearts as the planes flew straight and steady through the bursting flak, which had increased till it seemed to the watchers that nothing could live through it. Plane after plane peeled off, one or two engines on fire and crashed in the open fields to the north or, turning back, came down in or beyond the Rhine. One pilot spotted the signals, although a little too late. A few containers dropped from his aircraft and floated down towards the extreme edge of the dropping zone and the plane swung away before turning to make another run. As it turned, its starboard engine caught fire and under the frustrated gaze of the men on the ground, the aircraft completed a 180 degree turn and came in again much lower, no more than 300 feet above the watchers' heads. This time, the containers came out directly above the allotments, and the men on the tower could see clearly the strained faces of the men from the RESC delivery company as they pushed out the panniers of supplies. And then, one wing was gone, and the plane crashed, a blazing wreck, far out of the sight of the spellbound watchers in the houses and trenches below. Stuff me, Armstrong breathed. That took some guts. He looked round him. The other three were all looking towards the trees behind which the plane had crashed. O'Neill's face was expressionless, but his eyes shone with approbation. Bridgman was smiling quietly, his head nodding slowly up and down. Fraser had for a moment been shaken out of his affected composure. His face was white, his eyes wider than usual, and his lips were apart. The last of the planes made its run and dropped its supplies into the hands of the Germans in the north. Bridgman turned to Armstrong, his lips pulled back tight against his teeth. For all the good that supply drop did, they might as well have stayed at home and saved some valuable lives. Whatever happens, if we'll get that Eureka checked by the RAF when we get back. I shall be very interested to know where the fault lies. Get it packed up, I'll give you a shout when to come down. When we get back, Fraser looked at Armstrong as Bridgman and O'Neill disappeared down the stairs. That's what I call optimism. Do you really think he imagines we're going to get back? Before Armstrong had a chance to answer, a bullet struck the brickwork between them and they both ducked behind the cover of the balustrade. Armstrong collapsed the telescopic aerial and grinned wryly to himself. The fascination of watching the supply drop had made them all oblivious to danger. Earlier, he had reproved Fraser for showing his head and yet for long minutes the whole four of them had stood head and shoulders above the brickwork. He supposed that, like themselves, the Germans had had eyes only for the low-flying aircraft. They completed the packing of the set and had just lit cigarettes when they heard the whine of a shell as it passed to one side of the tower. Their eyes met, and then Fraser inhaled deeply and looked away as if uninterested in the decision Armstrong had to make. The corporal thought quickly. They had no duty to perform in the tower. Bridgman had left them there merely because they were under cover and out of the way, and because he had no need of them until the platoon moved back to the company area. The Germans had obviously spotted them, and probably thought the tower was being used as an artillery observation post it might well become very unhealthy for them. Come on, let's get out of here. Bridgman must have heard the whine of the first shell, but failed to register it as a threat to any particular part of his platoon. It was just one more sound to be added to the incessant crackle of small arms fire and the roar of bursting mortar bombs and shells that never quite stopped, but rose and fell around the fringes of the tightening divisional perimeter, sometimes holding out the promise that it would die out altogether, and at other times rising to a pitch of unbelievable intensity, 
until it became necessary to shut off one part of the mind as a protection against the build-up of sound which attacked and made raw every nerve in the body. He had collected headquarters section from the edge of the wood and as he started to move back he signalled to Gorman to close his section behind Blake on the road. He was 50 yards short of the tower when the first 88mm shell hit it, high up, just below the balustrade. Another blew a hole halfway down its sheer side. Bridgman shouted a quick order to Murray to get his section to the RV. He called to Corporal McEwen and O'Neill and together they ran towards the tower. As it was hit for the third time, he saw a figure stagger out from the door at its base. He recognised Fraser and saw blood on his face and on the back of his two hands, where he held them high up by his shoulders, one grasping the sling of his rifle, the other a German Schmeisser. While still ten yards short of where Fraser stood shaking his head, Alan heard a sudden burst of firing from beyond the RV where Blake and his men lay on each side of the road, denying German infiltration between two companies of the border regiment. Alan slowed his stride. O'Neill, he jerked over his shoulder. Get Fraser back to the RV. McEwen, get in there and see what's happened to Armstrong. He broke into a run again and shouted back to the corporal, whatever else you do, collect the Eureka. McEwen raised his free-handed recognition and headed for the door of the tower. Alan kept on running to where he could hear Blake and his men engaging the enemy. McEwen slid through the open door and looked quickly round. It was all right for Bridgman. He was heading away from the tower and it was the tower that was being shelled. There was a pile of rubble just past the door and the corporal climbed over it. He could see a gaping hole in the wall halfway up the stairs and through it the blue sky and the tops of trees. That was life. This was death. It was like standing in an open tomb waiting for the lid to be sealed down. He could hear his own breathing sounding high above the settling brickwork on the stairs and the noise of firing muffled by the tower's walls. He could see one boot and part of a gaiter sticking out from the mound of bricks and plaster on the stairs and looking above it he could see a small patch of camouflage smock and then more bricks and part of a steel helmet. He climbed up warily, one hand extended. He gripped the gaiter. It felt dead. He rested one hand on the rubble and reached out for the square of camouflaged cloth. The fourth shell hit the tower at its highest point and clouds of dust and splinters of brick rained down on his back. He snatched his hand away as if it had been burned. At the open door he paused long enough to gulp great lungfuls of air which quietened the heaving of his chest and soothed the fluttering of his mind. And then he was running hard for the RV. Bridgman threw himself down beside Blake. I'm not quite sure what the position is, the sergeant said. It's either a small patrol or just snipers infiltrating. I think we got a couple of them, but they nailed Bert Taylor before we spotted him. I reckon we can disengage all right. It's just a question of sliding back one at a time till we're round the bend. They're not going to follow up. There's not enough of them. Right, then let's get moving. I'll take Marston's chaps, you bring your own as soon as we're out of sight. Presently, while he waited for Blake to join him, Alan gave his orders for the march back to the company area. Then he called Corporal McEwen over. What happened to Armstrong? He was dead, sir. There's nothing I could do. And the Eureka? McEwen hesitated for a moment. I blew it, sir. Why? I told you I wanted it. It wasn't just a matter of recovering the set. There was something wrong with it, and I wanted to find out what it was. McEwen's eyes slid from Bridgman's face. I didn't know that, sir. The set was smashed. There was a great chunk of brickwork on top of it. There seemed no point in carting it around. All right, join your section. Alan looked back to where he could see the last of Blake's men slipping through the bushes. He was angry, but he was trying to be fair. There was no point in carrying unnecessary equipment and increasing the possibility of a secret Eureka being captured by the Germans. But the independent company had never lost a Eureka set yet. Still, perhaps McEwen's action had been the best one in the circumstances. The march back across the divisional perimeter gave all of them an uncanny feeling that their platoon represented the only real life inside the German ring. The occasional head cautiously raised from a slit trench or peering from the window of a house to eye them curiously as they plodded by seemed to have no substance. They came into the company area from the south and were told that their positions were under fairly accurate fire from snipers and that it was going to be difficult to relieve the sections from the other two platoons who were holding them. They accomplished the relief in short, half-section dashes, but not without having two men wounded, one from their own platoon as he went down the slope, and one from Ramsden's as he came up. <laughs>